afternoon, evening, night, wherever you are. Um, so this is about the media subsystem in the kernel and particularly how do we test this? Uh, I, my, I assume that not everybody is very aware uh, and, and knowledgeable about the media subsystem. So the first step is to give a bit of history, uh, show what features there are, uh, very, very high level architecture. Uh, so that it's a bit clearer to have a bit better understanding of why it is quite hard to test this subsystem. Um, it's pretty old. So the first drivers appeared all the way back in 1996, 27 years ago. Time flies. Uh, BTTV is, was a PCI card that you could use to capture TV. So it had a tuner and you could, uh, you could just tune in into a channel and capture it. Uh, that one still exists today. It's still in the kernel. It still maintains. And in fact, it's currently undergoing quite a bit of work because it's the last remaining driver that is using an old framework that we want to get rid of. So someone is, uh, I'm mentoring someone that is doing that work, replacing it with the new framework. It's actually a really nice card. Uh, if you want to capture, say, record video from, for example, an old VHS tape, then this is pretty good hardware. And that is quite amazing for a 27 year old piece of hardware. Uh, one other that didn't fare so well was a black and white uh, webcam. It was about postage sized images in black and white or monochrome using a parallel port. Uh, that driver is gone. That no longer exists. Um, these first drivers, they didn't have a, didn't use a framework. They just did everything themselves. So the video for Linux version one, yes, there was a version one, appeared around 1999, uh, but it had lots of shortcomings. And three years later, they developed uh, version two that we still use today with lots of additions and improvements. Uh, I started contributing about a year later, so I missed the development of that API. But, you know, it's now 21 years old, and I think for an API, it's not doing too bad. Um, about 12 years ago, the first version of the API was removed, so you won't see it anymore in the kernel. Uh, so this also proves that, yes, you can remove an API from the kernel, but it takes a lot of time. Uh, these first drivers, they were all fairly similar. So TV capture, video capture, webcams, all video capture, really simple pipeline, nothing particularly complicated. But then you got uh, smartphones and they were using SFCs and they wanted to use a sensor and do lots of complicated processing steps. So you started to get these really complicated devices with lots of processing blocks inside, and we needed support for that. And around 10 years ago, we finalized the first version for that. It was called the Media Controller. It's basically, it, it did lots of different things, but it allowed you to control what is actually inside the hardware. Um, now the media subsystem, so driver slash media, it's, it's not just video for Linux. It is also digital video broadcast. So that is digital video in Europe, that's the DVB standards. In the US it's ATSC. They all fall under the same, we call it DVB as it, it's sort of a subsystem of the media subsystem. Uh, and also infrared. Now they are all part of media because uh, in the beginning DVB was completely separate, but then you started to get tuners that did both analog tuning and digital tuning. So both sub subsystems had to use the same hardware. So these days it's all part of media. Uh, infrared remote controls might seem an odd one, but most of the TV capture devices uh, came with remote control. So I would, I think about 
say 90 to 95 percent of all supported remote controls they're all coming from these types of devices and that's why it's part of the media uh, I'm not discussing DVB and infrared uh, in this talk. I'm just saying it's part of media, but there are, it, it, there's not a huge amount of things that can be tested with that, and there's not much done in that either. Um, the last edition that I made about seven years ago was support for HDMI CEC, Consumer Electronics Control, and I'll get back to that later in this uh, talk. So I'll be concentrating for this first two thirds roughly of the talk on Video for Linux. Terrible name, by the way, if, if I could go back in time and tell them don't do this because you're talking about the Video for Linux, Linux subsystem, it, it's an awful name, but uh, it's it stuck. So I have to live with it. Um, but it's, it's actually an API that supports a huge range of features. So video capture, video outputs, tuning for or TV tuners. Uh, it had uh, VBI capture and output. VBI stands for vertical blanking interface. And uh, with analog uh, video, you have, you know, it basically goes back all the way to the old cathode tube ray uh, systems where you have an electron beam and it's showing the picture and then it has to go back from one corner to the other corner. And during that time, you have the opportunity to send metadata. Or, or uh, it, it's a sort of a sideband channel that happens during the blanking time of the video. And it's used uh, for closed captioning in the US. In Europe, it's primarily used for teletext. Uh, I think that is all still exists and is still operational. So if you have an old TV, it will still be using this, I think. Uh, and we had support for that. Uh, but it also supports memory to memory devices, uh, primarily codecs, A264, A265, but it can also be a scalar or a color space converter. So you give it a uh, frame, compressed or not, and it will be processed and you get something else back. Um, the other thing, so maybe a bit old, but uh, radio support is there. Uh, why radio support? What does that have to do with video? It comes again back to the old TV cards. They all had a tuner. And if you already had a tuner for video, then it was easy to add a tuner for radio. So consider radio uh, TV without the video. So you're just left with the audio part. <clears throat> uh, I'm not only radio capture, but it is even possible uh, to support a radio transmitter. We have a few. There, there tend to be really USB sticks that allow you to uh, transmit on a particular frequency. And then if you have a radio, you can listen to it. Software-defined radio as well. I, I'm not going into detail about that. RDS, radio data system, that is sort of a VBI for radio. So it's metadata traffic information that is part of the radio FM signal. You know, analog radio, it's it's slowly dying out, particularly in Europe, I think. So how long this, I, I haven't seen any uh, patches or anybody talking about this in ages. It's probably dying out slowly. Then there is device topology. There's the media controller, what we call it. And that is for these very complex pipelines. It, it gives you an a view of all the blocks inside the hardware and it allows you to change links between them. Say you can bypass certain processing blocks if you want to. And also a low level sub device uh, control. So that allows you to, for example, directly control a sensor chip. Again, it's part for the support for these complex hardware devices. And then, strangely enough, uh, touch devices. We had some uh, some laptops, a specific hardware, and they wanted to have some debug. Uh, basically, it's it's a picture, grayscale picture of the touch points where you touch the panel, and it shows up as a grayscale picture. And it was used for debugging, see what is going on in certain uh, somewhat obscure features. 
uh, but you know, it's basically a picture. So it's part of video of Linux as well. There are, I think, only two drivers that actually use this. What is also interesting about media hardware is it's that it's never or almost never one chip. It's a constellation of all sorts of different devices. So you typically have a DMA engine, you have a sensor, you might have a video receiver, tuners, infrared, some mixers. The sky is the limit. They are infinitely inventive. But the key point here is you have just a whole lot of devices that all have to work together. So a, a typical driver, if you look at it, it, it has a, what we call a bridge driver. That's the top level driver. That's typically a platform driver or USB or PCI. And that usually does the DMA. So it's, uh, it, it's sitting on a bus where it's able to transfer the video data into memory or the other way around for a memory to memory device. But this is where the DMA engine typically is implemented. And then there are a whole lot of additional devices on a board or possibly inside an SOC that uh, are all uh, determined through a USB ID or PCI ID or a device tree or whatever. And the bridge driver will load all those in until they're all there. And then it is finally able to register everything and you're ready to actually use the device. So this is quite important that it, it's not just a single driver. You typically have lots of different drivers that all work together. And internally in the kernel, the, the APIs between these different hardware blocks, it's, it's more or less standardized. So that allows you to easily swap out a sensor, for example, to another model without having to rewrite the whole bridge drive. Um, with such a large feature set, we have lots and lots of IOCTOLs. Um, Video for Linux itself has 82 IOCTOLs defined as of today. The sub-device API, so that's for sensors and, and low-level things like that, they have 25. The media controller has eight, so well over 100 IOCTOLs. That sounds terrible, but luckily uh, devices only have a subset of features. So you have a number of core IOCTOLs, around 20. Again, this too sounds worse than it is because some of these IOCTOLs, they actually translate into a framework and a driver only has to implement, say, three functions and everything else is handled inside the framework. So you might have eight controls, but you have to do a lot less in the driver. And there are also IOCTOLs that replace all the ones and then we always provide glue codes that translate the old IOCTOL into the new one. So the driver only has to support a new one. So it's not quite as bad as it looks. Still, uh, there's about, <clears throat> about 20 core IOCTOLs. And then you, depending on the feature sets, you have a number of, say, six IOCTOLs if you have video inputs, another six if you have an output. If you don't have a tuner, you can save eight IOCTOLs. If you don't care about analog TV, that's another eight. So you're, you're basically have a subset of all these IOCTOLs in practice, but still it's it's a quite a quite a big API, but it's very uh, it does very different things, and then it depends on what exactly it is that you uh, that your hardware does, how how bad it is, how much you have to implement. So how on earth do you test such a wide variety of IOCTOLs and features? That is really what this talk is all about. Uh, uh, let me start. This is what we do. This may not be the best way. Perhaps there are better ways that you can think of. Um, uh, this is just what we have today and how we uh, how it works for us. And I, I think it works reasonably well. It's certainly not perfect, but um, we can get a job done. 
So the problems with complicated hardware like this is, of course, uh, as I said, you know, the vast variety of hardware out there. And not only that, a lot of this hardware is very difficult to get to obtain. So if you uh, say you want to make an application that is able to work with webcams, uh, there's no way you can get all possible webcams because the, the, a lot of the older ones, they are, you can only get them on eBay uh, or not at all. Um, if you are talking about the complex video pipelines, they're often development boards that you may not be able to get as a private person. You might have to be a company. They might be very expensive. So there, there's just no way you can well, I'm I'm a I'm one of the maintainers. I've been doing this for 23 years and have several drawers full of of hardware, and I don't have a full coverage of all the features. And anyway, if you get an SOC, say a development board or a single board computer, it takes a lot of time to set everything up. Uh, it tends to keep breaking, <laughs> so it, it it does not scale. It, there's no, it's not an option to just buy everything in sites and make a big test farm because you will, it, that doesn't work. And especially if you are just, you know, I want to make an application to work with a webcam, you can't buy everything. You know, doesn't, doesn't, it's not possible. So that also means that if you want to test APIs, we don't have the hardware to, to cover it all. Um, speaking as a subsystem maintainer, uh, if I make changes in the media core frameworks, I would like to know that there are no regressions. If I don't, if I'm not able to get all the hardware, how would I do that? And even if I had all the hardware, it would take ages to run all the tests on all the different hardware. So again, it, it does not scale. This is not workable. Um, related to that is I'm a driver developer, for example, I make a new driver. How do I test my driver and know that I implemented all the IOCTLs that I have to and that they're all implemented correctly and I, I covered all the corner cases? So I would really like to have something for that. And as an application developer, it comes back to the earlier points that I made. I can't have all the different hardware out there. So I need a way to be able to test my application and see if it can handle hardware that is different from what I have today. So perhaps not a simple webcam, but perhaps I'm, instead of talking to a webcam, I'm talking to a HDMI video receiver. How would I test that if I can't get the hardware? Uh, and finally, that uh, is particularly an issue with HCMI CEC. Uh, we'll talk about that later. Uh, it might not just be your own device that you are working with or making a driver for, but it might also be that you want to verify if remote device implements everything correctly. So there are lots of things that you want to do and you're all um, blocked by the fact that it's not possible to get all the, the various type of hardware. So what we came up with is a, a number of things. So first of all, <clears throat> we needed, and, and that was to actually to protect our sanity as maintainers. We created a compliance test utility that driver developers can run against their driver to verify if their driver is compliant. And in fact, if you submit a new driver today or are making major driver changes, the compliance output has to be included in the cover letter of your pack series. Uh, it, it's, as, a, as a subsystem maintainer, code reviewer, it's marvelous because if, if it passes, then I know that all the standards stuff is already tested by the utility. I don't have to, to review against corner cases where a field isn't filled in or not correct because it will be caught by the compliance test. Uh, it's of course great for the driver developer because they get a lot more um, 
confidence in their work. And it, for me, it's great because it saves a lot of time in a code review. The only thing I need, well, the only thing, uh, the main thing I need to take care of as maintainer is to look for those things that I know that the compliance test for one reason or another doesn't catch. It doesn't catch everything. Uh, there, are, there are simply the number of permutations is huge. So not everything can be found and certain things is not something you can actually figure out from the application side. Uh, but this, this is a huge help for us. So that's one part. And the second part deals with the hardware. Since we can't ask people to buy all these different hardware devices, the next best thing is to make it ourselves and emulate it. So we have a number of what we call virtual drivers, uh, not really the right thing. The, the driver is real, uh, but the hardware that it emulates is virtual. So, we, we've been calling it virtual drivers and it, the name stuck. So they emulate hardware. And there you can do whatever you want. You can emulate the wildest things. And we worked hard to make these drivers support as much um, variations as is possible. So that is fantastic because now you can just, uh, as an application, developer, you can just load that driver and test it with your application. For us, it means that we can test core framework changes against those drivers using the same compliance tests. You know, if it, if it passed before, then after the change, it still has to pass. So that gives, it all comes back to giving a lot more confidence and, and helping out to, to avoid having to to deal with large hardware farms or anything like that. And finally, a nice advantage of emulating hardware is that you can do error injection. So you can, uh, for example, emulate what happens when the device is suddenly unplugged or when there are uh, errors during video capture. And that is also very helpful in trying to uh, test whether your application is, uh, is uh, robust enough. So the compliance tool, referral to compliance. It's the main workhorse that we have. It started 15 years ago. That's when I first started writing it because I was sick and tired of having to do the code reviews, it's, it's kind of like dry swimming. You don't really know whether you didn't forget anything. Uh, the initial version just had, I think it verified three boring IOCTLs. Um, took six years to finally get the tests for video streaming in, which is one of the main key things you want to test. And another year to test uh, the, all the various combinations between video formats, or, or it, that's really the format that the video ends up in memory, because there are many different ways you can encode video in memory. Um, and also for crop and compose combinations where you crop a bit from the picture and only copy that into memory, it, it gets very complicated very quickly when you have these things. So it, was also very difficult to, to write these tests and they're certainly not perfect. But again, it's, it's, it's good enough. If it passes this, then uh, I have a lot more confidence in the device. And you may wonder why does it take six years? And that is basically uh, writing test code is hard and it's kind of boring. You much rather be working on, uh, on new bleeding edge fancy stuff than trying to test all these boring things. So that's also why the first version just had a few IOCTLs. I thought, okay, let's just start. Start with something and then bit by bit, extend it and make it bigger and bigger. And it took quite a long time before it really took off. Currently, um, it depends a bit on the, the driver that you're testing, but there are about a thousand tests that are being performed. 
a lot of these are very simple. So testing that a field is set up properly, um, things like that. Uh, so what is important that if we create a new API in NVIDIA for Linux, then it also, it has to be documented, very important. And documenting your API is a very good way of um, figuring out whether your API actually is understandable, can be used. If you have to, if you have to write pages of pages of all sorts of if then else things in that situation do that, in that situation do that, then it's probably not a very good API. If you can have a nice description that makes sense, then it's probably a much better API. And the next best thing after writing documentation is to write tests. Because you have to be able to write a test for it as well. So you need to have a way of detecting that the API, that the IOCTL is actually available, uh, know what it can do, uh, does it handle all the corner cases, have it documented all of the corner cases, when does it return errors, what sort of errors does it return? So the combination of documentation and writing a test is really helpful in getting confidence of your new API. Uh, what is also important to note the compliance test is actually more strict than the video for Linux specification. It assumes that a driver is using all the correct core frameworks and is completely up to date with the latest and best practices of the specification. And since video for Linux is, you know, 21 years old, uh, things have changed over time. So certain practices are allowed because you may have an old kernel with an old driver that, that still uses that old method. But in a new driver, you don't want it. Now, the compliance test is, is always assuming that you're up to date. You're using the very latest kernel, not, not even the released kernel. You're using the kernel, our staging kernel for the new features coming into the next kernel. So you really have to be at the latest and greatest kernel tree of the media subsystem. And you need to get the latest uh, code from the V4L Utils Git repository. That's where this utility is. Because we keep it in sync. So when you make changes into the staging tree for the kernel, then we also update V4L Utils. So it understands the latest additions in that kernel. So we, we always keep those two in sync. And you need to be at the same level if you want to run it. Um, as I said, tests, it, it, I, it's hard and time consuming to write tests. So keep it as simple as possible. And most of the tests are basically, it's a simple marker fail on test with a condition. And if the condition is, uh, uh, is true, then it will just return an error. And in the text uh, output, it will just show up as, as you can see there, it's a fail and then the source code of the test and the line number of the test and what the condition is that it's testing for. It doesn't explain what is going on because that's way too much work. You have to go into the codes, look it up, what is it testing here? If you're lucky, there is a comment, most often there isn't. And uh, then you have to dig a little bit deeper or ask me, but it is, uh, you don't actually run the compliance test all that often. Only if you work with a new driver or something like that, then you need it. So you can spend a lot of time in very fancy failure messages that nobody really uses. It's much better to keep, at least that is my philosophy when it comes to testing these things, keep more important to have the tests, even if they are a bit obscure and perhaps you may have to ask someone what exactly is going on here, what is being tested. More important to have the test. And then if it turns out to be really confusing for, for users who will need to use this to check their new driver, then you can always add some more comments 
but most of the time it's it's actually fairly easy to understand what is happening and so i have a couple of questions on this topic do you yes yeah. so uh, the first one is uh, um is there a way to test a media device or individual video and sub devs need to be passed um can I see the question in the chat window? Yes, um, you can see that in the Q and A box. Q and A, wrong, wrong one. Ah. Uh, yes, you can test the media device. So you have a choice between. Depends on your the options that you give. You can actually just give uh, lowercase m and then the media device, and then it will actually go through all the devices that are found in the topology of that media device. But you can also check individual uh, video or uh, sub-devices. So both situations are possible. Uh, but yes, uh, you can do that. It, it was, uh, uh, it's, it's really handy and we use it. I will come back to that later in the demo. We will actually use it in a, in a, in a test regression that we run every day where we just pass the media device and then it tests all the devices inside there. Um, is there a way to associate kernel version with compliance test version? For example, if we are developing on 6.1, then which version of compliance test do we use? No, no. We, this question occasionally pops up. Um, most of the time, the compliance tests will work fine, even though it's for a later or staging kernel. It will typically work fine on, for example, on 6.1 kernel, but there may be failures because some things have, have changed. It's, it's usually okay, but not always. Uh, the, the main purpose here of the compliance test is twofold. It's, it's for ourselves as sub-maintainers to make sure we don't introduce regressions. So we have to be at the very latest bleeding edge uh, staging tree. And the second is for people writing new drivers. And there too, you want to be on basically the latest kernel because you want to use the latest features. So this is something we never actually um worked on and if we would try to you know uh detect oh this is a six of one kernel so these these and these tests i shouldn't do then the code becomes terrible spaghetti code and very hard to maintain and the whole purpose the way it's been developed is really to keep the maintenance load as low as possible because it it's annoying to write tests a lot of work and you want to keep it as simple as possible. Um, there, that also means that, so if you look at this fail on tests, a lot of these tests are done by topic. So you test all the input and output diopters. But if there is a failure in the beginning, then it will just return that test and it will say at the top level, it will say inputs, outputs, this, this failed. It doesn't try to, be smart about it and, and continue. It just fails that topic. And quite often there are knock-on effects in later tests because certain information isn't stored. Because, it, for example, the number of inputs, if there was an early failure, the number of inputs would be zero or, or at least different from the actual number of inputs. And then later tests might fail on that. So if you are running this, you always start with the first failures and fix them first and then rerun and see what, how much that fixed later on. Again, it comes back to keeping the threshold for writing new tests as low as possible since that is the most time consuming part. I'm lazy. Okay, I admit I'm lazy. It would be nice to spend a lot of time in making really fancy tests, but that just doesn't uh, doesn't scale for if i may days. add that's exactly what we do in rest of the kernel uh, tests as well k self test and k unit and on all of those because you do not want to tie release uh, to information into the tests because we want to be able to take the tests and run them on uh, uh, on uh, any kernel version and get results 
And if the test uh, is newer and then you have older kernel you're testing on, the test will all, uh, the one thing that to ensure is that test will always gracefully exit and say, I can't test this feature. So that is what we do in the kernel really. So that's exactly what B4L does also, just to add that. Thank you. Right. Um, so that was the compliance test. Now is the second pillar of testing in the media subsystem, and that is test drivers, the virtual drivers that emulate hardware. So the main one, and that most people know, is the Vivid driver. This actually came from a much older VV driver. If you go to a really old kernel, 2.4 probably, uh, it will still have that driver. I think it was originally contributed by some German magazine where they wanted to have you know, a test driver for video that sort of emulated the webcam. Uh, but it was quite limited. And at some point, I can't really remember when exactly, I was sick and tired of it and I ripped it out and replaced it with Vivid, which is far more capable than the old Vivi. Um, so it does. Uh, video capture output, vertical blanking, radio, software-defined radio, metadata, touch capture, even HDMI, CEC emulation. And it's quite close to what a real hardware of that type will do. Well, there's no, there's no real hardware of this type because this is an insane piece of hardware that, that almost combines everything that you can throw at it. But it is an excellent, uh, I'm, I'm very pleased with that. I will give a very quick demonstration later about this one. And it's really neat and it, it, it's not perfect. Uh, if you're interested, there are a number of volunteer projects for this driver and some of the others as well, where we want to, we really would like to have someone improve it even further, make it even closer to what real hardware would do. Um, but this is it's it's a pretty neat driver, and uh, at least Debian is it uh, distributed. It's enabled as part of the kernel, so you can easily run it, uh, load it, and run it. Um, the other we have is uh, VI M2M. Uh, it's a memory-to-memory -memory video scaler. VI Codec. That's a memory-to-memory -memory video codec test driver. So it's a, both a decoder and an encoder, and even a, what we call a stateless decoder. I'm not going into detail, but um, that's great for testing codec APIs. VIMC, that's more like a, a complicated video pipeline type of driver. Uh, very new, Vizel test driver to test stateless codec APIs. So we, we really have a fairly good set of uh, test drivers for, a variety, for emulating a variety of hardware. And this allows us to run regression tests using these drivers that covers quite a large part of the video for Linux API. And it's really the only way we can do that. There is one question in the Q&A uh, about when to when is the right time to test compliance. Hans. Um, well, it, it it doesn't hurt to. So most people, I think, run it at the end when they are satisfied with their code. But it doesn't hurt to run it earlier. However, if you are still implementing uh, IOCTOs that are needed, then it will keep failing. So uh, what, what is true is that the, the sequence of tests is kind of from the beginning core IOCTOs and then building it up and then streaming is, I think, pretty much at the end. So you might be able to, you know, at least verify, do I have all the core IOCTOs correct? Uh, you can do that relatively early on and then do I have all the input IOCTOs correct? So if you're building it up a little bit. So it, 
but it, it really depends a little bit on your driver and, and, uh, and how you've been developing it. it. But again, it doesn't hurt. I mean, if you get lots of failures and you know that it's because I haven't implemented something yet, then you you just postpone it. That's not a, it definitely has to be done before you submit to the mailing list because we want to see it. But well, how often you do it during your development, um, it's up to you. It might, you know, it gives if you if you do it, say once a day or something, uh, whatever. When you have a new feature, it it gives you a bit of confidence if it passes that particular test. But for us as a maintainer, I the only requirement is that it's part of the cover letter. And obviously, if you post it with lots of failures, <laughs> then you're not going very far with your submission. Uh, and if you have questions about failures, just ask me. I am perfectly, I'm very happy to answer that. That's not a that, not a problem at all. Okay. Demo. So I I wanted to first show off. Oh, that's my webcam here. Let's not use that. So this is actually the Vivid driver. You can see. I hope it's readable. But this is the this is a Q Fever L two. It's sort of a a GUI uh, Swiss Army knife for drivers. So. Oh. If I run it, this is what you get. So the uh, what is quite nice is we made a, a test pattern generator in the kernel that these test drivers can use, these virtual drivers. They all use the same code. And it's fairly um, extensive. So we have a whole bunch of, uh, of color test patterns. Uh, you can do all sorts of uh, interesting things with it, depending on what you want to test. You can even move it around. Let's stop that because it's very annoying. It has an OSD where it shows time and some frame numbers, some more information about uh, about what is happening. You can see here. Uh, vivid controls there are all sorts of interesting uh, test things you can have a square in the middle or some special codes that cause problems um, you have can have a disconnect you can inject uh, an error condition for uh, for a buffer hey there you see the error appearing so there are all sorts of things that you can do here to emulate real issues And what I am, okay, I, I admit I had fun with this. So this is this is actually the TV input. It's emulating a tuner as well. So here you see the frequency. And if you keep changing the frequency, hey, suddenly you lose the color information, just like a real TV. You know, when you get a bit too far from the optimal frequency, then the first thing to go is the color. And then if you go a bit further, you get a static image. I, I, I... So sue me, this was fun to do. That is very easy, actually. So this is, uh, and the other thing, so it has a webcam. Um, now the webcam actually goes up to 4K, so you can test that, HDMI. So there's again a huge number of resolutions that you can do here. So that's what it looks why is this dark? Uh, not sure. So uh, this is this is kind of a gooey Swiss Army knife for for these types of devices. So it's nice to play with. But we are here for the compliance test. So this is uh, I run the compliance test for Vivid for the video def default video notes. This is what you get. 
So 113 tests, they're all good. Well, that's what I really hope that would happen. You can test streaming. So here it starts streaming. It, it tests various combinations of streaming. Uh, so with using select, with, with no polling at all, with using select to wait for an event when a buffer is available to use uh, uh, an epoll as well. We had some subtle issues with epoll in the past, so this is a good test to have. Also some, some tests for blocking weights. And there's, there's all sorts of um, combinations there. And you can also, if I make sure I'm using the right one, uh two i think yeah so this is using the media device so the media device contains the whole topology of all the devices that fifit has so this test just checks the media controller so test the uh, iot the the topology etc uh one thing to note at the start here So this is the version of the compliance test. This is saying that it's a 64-bit architecture. And this is that time t is 64-bit. So on 32-bit architectures, time t can be 32-bit or 64-bit. And we had to, when we added support for 64-bit time t on the 32-bit architecture, uh, we added support for that in the compliance test to verify that everything is correct. So here you can see how it is uh, compiled, what the mode is. And this is the SHA of the last commit from which it was built. So if you post uh, a cover letter containing the output of FIFA 2 compliance, I always check the SHA to make sure that you're using the latest version. And all too often they just make a user version distributed uh, or uh, obtained from a distribution, Debian or whatever, and they're always too old. So I always use that to check that you actually have the right one. So if I use a lowercase m2, then it will actually start going through all the, the, the various devices. So I'm not letting this run um, because this takes too long, uh, but I have Uh, output of that. So as I said before, we use this test. No, wait, uh, let me show something else first. So as part of the Vivero UTS, we also have a contrib test directory and there's a test media script. And that is what we use. Uh, that is what we use in our daily builds. So this is actually um, running through all the virtual drivers, running VFRL to compliance on them, do all sorts of other tests, for example, unloading it unexpectedly. And that takes about 17 minutes. And there you can see the real power of all these tests because so it started off, starts out with the Vivid driver and then it's testing all these various devices. So video zero, video one, they all do different things. So they all have different tests. And if we go all the way to the bottom, yeah, here we go. We have a summary. So these are all the Vivid devices. You can see a summary of all the tests that are being done. So for, Complete tests of Vivid, you get almost a thousand tests. Uh, it's done twice because there are two Vivid instances, or one is single planar and the other is not. They're, they're configured in different ways. So we want to do both. CC tests that are being done, get more into that later. And then the VI M2M -M driver, VIMP, Vi codec. And at the end, you will see that there are a bit over 3,000 tests that are being done in order to verify that there are no regressions in the core frameworks and no regressions, of course, in these virtual drivers either. The whole run takes about 17 minutes. 
Uh, and it's very useful because we've caught a lot of issues with it. Uh, things that you're developing and you you don't realize that you actually break something and it's typically being caught by this test. And it relies heavily on VFRL to compliance to do all the actual work. Um, yeah. Um, any questions? That's before I continue. Are there any questions about VFRL2? Okay, looks like a, a question just showed up in the QA. Yeah. Uh, how do streaming tests work for media devices where all video nodes be streamed? No. So that's a limitation of VFRL2 compliance. So it's it will stream all the video nodes, but one by one. It won't try to stream on multiple video nodes in parallel. Um, the number of permutations and the complexity of the tests would is basically what makes that very difficult to do. Um, if you're volunteering, <laughs> feel free. But it's really hard, I think, to, to do that right. Uh, so a typical case where, uh, one case where it does happen is for memory to memory devices, of course, because you always have to give it something in order to get something back. So that, that is definitely done at the same time. Um, but a common other case would be for, uh, for analog video capture and vertical blanking capture at the same time. So that, that we, we don't do that. Uh, it is something I would ask. Again, it's a standard definition, so it doesn't happen very often anymore. But if you would make something, a driver that does that, then it would always ask, have you tested that? But it, it gets very difficult when the number of combinations just becomes insane when you try to do that. Um, monitoring the latest API changes and updating the compliance tests correspondingly sound like a very hard task. How do you do this? Well, um, first of all, I'm, I'm one of the media maintainers, so I know about API changes and we'll have discussed it, uh, perhaps quite possibly made it myself. So the, the monitoring part is easy, um, updating the compliance tests. So the, whoever is adding the API is responsible for implementing the compliance tests. So if it's me, if I added it, I proposed it and they accept it and I did it, then I will have to make the tests. Someone else did it, then I require that they make a patch for it. So it's part of the work of adding APIs, which is why adding an API is hard. One of the hardest things to do. Um, it's hard because it's difficult to design in a way that isn't outdated next year. So you, you're trying to be well, future proof, but at, at least you, you want to make something that stands to, uh, is still something that works five years from now. Um, I've lost track of my chain of thoughts now. Oh yeah. Uh, the other part that is difficult is, is uh, making sure you've covered all the corner cases, all the error conditions. Uh, does it make sense? Is it, can you document it? Can, and again, if it's difficult to document or it's difficult to write tests for it, then that's an indication that your API probably needs some improvements. So it's, it's just part of the work of adding an API. It's, that's the way it is. Um, how does compliance know how to configure media pipeline? Um, only for the virtual drivers. So it, specifically for the, the virtual drivers that we have today, only VIMC needs this, and there we know it. So there the test scripts, it's actually not even the compliance test, it's just a test script, test media script sets it up. If you have to deal with such devices, uh, you will have most likely have to use lib camera. And they, I, I, I haven't, I'm not very experienced with it. I'm not an expert on it, but I assume they will have a lot of tests as well in lib camera. 
uh, you just it, it's just a, a limitation of the compliance test. So yes, you would have if you want to use it, you would have to configure the media pipeline first before you can lose, use the compliance test. Okay. So next part, this won't take as much time as the previous one. Uh, HDMI CEC, Consumer Electronics Control. So first of all, what is it? I'm the proud maintainer of what is probably the slowest bus in the kernel, which goes at a blistering speed of 400 bits per second, 10 bits per byte of payload. So that's 40 bytes per second. Now I'm, I'm very proud of being having made uh, that uh, API. Uh, it is a pin on the HDMI connector. So that makes this even more bizarre. So you have these uh, 600 megahertz of pixel clock uh, sending pixels at a blistering rate. And then there is this single pin going at 400 bouts. It's pretty insane. But it, it, it all uh, originated in the old days of video recorders, where what I wanted to have is you put in your videotape and uh, the would start playing and the TV would automatically go on. So that's when this was designed in a, at least a physical layer comes from those times. And they had a microcontroller, almost certainly that was doing pulling on the bus and they weren't very fast. So you were limited to this speed. And when they designed HDMI for some reason, I still don't know, they decided to just take that protocol and incorporate it in HDMI. It's only the low level physical layer that they copied or the, the low le lower levels of the protocol, not the high level protocol messages. That's quite different. But the idea is exactly the same. You have a Blu-ray player, you put in a disc, a TV and the AV receiver all goes automatically on and they can all communicate with one another. Um, so when you wrote, when you made this subsystem, little subsystem, uh, the IOCTOS were not a problem. There are about 11 IOCTOS. Most of them are very simple. Uh, I wrote a compliance test, CEC compliance. The amount of work done to test the IOCTOS is quite limited. Uh, that actually was never the problem with CEC. CEC, uh, as if you look into the specifications, it is a very clear committee projects, committee standards, uh, all lots of legacy stuff, uh, fairly poorly defined. They, they improved a bit, HDMI 2.0, but it's still not the greatest, most precise specification ever around. To make it worse, um, especially in the beginning, a lot of vendors added custom uh, messages so it would work if you had, say, from brand X, you used the display from brand X, the Blu-ray player from brand X, and the AV receiver from brand X, and it would all work. If you replace the AV receiver with a one from brand Y, it suddenly wouldn't work anymore because it was relying on some custom messages. Things have improved a lot. Uh, these days, most devices do a fairly decent job to at least uh, the, the main messages to get it in in a standard way, but it remains one of the protocols that uh, it, it, it's, it's, it doesn't always work, especially if a device doesn't adhere to the proper implementation. So one of the things that I wanted to do with CEC compliance, I have to add here that at work, we rely a lot on this protocol. So it was not just important for me, but also important for, for work. So for the CEC compliance test, what I wanted to have is not just that it could test my own implementation, but also a remote implementation. And I could connect it to a display and just run a whole bunch of tests and see if the display would implement everything according to the specification. Uh, so typical answer is usually not. 
there are almost always some oddities or things that are not quite the way they should be. There are also discussions sometimes what the specification actually says. As I said, there, it's not the greatest one. There are ambiguities in there. But uh, CEC compliance is interesting and different from what is done in V4L2 compliance in that it's probably 90% of the code is more related to testing a remote device than testing my own device. Uh, so it would, again, hardware can be a bit tricky to get. So we, I extended the Vivid driver to emulate CEC. Vivid driver already supported or emulated HDMI. So it made sense to add CEC to that as well. So it's useful for regression tests, application testing. And lastly, there is actually a very nice uh, CEC GPIO driver. Remember, it's just a single line in the HDMI connector. So you can just, if you have the right device, you can hook up that CEC line to GPIO pin on, for example, a Raspberry Pi. And then you can use the CEC GPIO driver to directly drive that pin and read it out and use that to implement CEC. You would not normally do this. So normal CEC hardware is uh, there are basically two parts. Either it's an IP block inside an IC that is dealing with all the timings and you will just get, so when you want to transmit something, you give the whole message and it will just send it out. When it receives something, you get an interrupt and you read out the whole message. Everything else is handled inside uh, the IP block. Uh, it can also be a microcontroller that does basically the same function. So it would actually pull the pin, but from the outside, you have typically some sort of mailbox interface to again, get the whole message out and you don't have to deal with the low level details. Uh, there are some drivers, some devices. I know one all winner chip that was very cheap and they actually just provided a register straight to the GPIO pin as well. But the primary extremely useful reason for using this driver is that you can get a, the whole low level trace of what is happening on the bus and you can do low level error injections. So for example, arbitration lost is a very difficult condition to test when you're sending a message and someone else is sending a message at the same time. So one of those two needs to win. A lot of hardware doesn't do that right. And you can test that using a GPIO driver. The only reason you can use this is that it's so slow because normally you can't get, uh, can't do this fast enough and reliably enough. But because it's such a slow protocol, you can actually get away with it. So we use this a lot for testing uh, various devices as well. Very useful. Okay. This won't be it's just a short demo because it's not terribly interesting, I think. So here you can see if you just run CCCTL, you see the Vivid driver. This is the capture device. And it's already configured. As you see, it's configured as a TV. It has a logical address, which is 0 to 15. It's basically a nickname of the device. It, it's a horrible protocol. You don't really want to know all too much about it. And this is the other Vivid device. You know, CEC only makes sense if you have two devices talking to one another. So Vivid has an input and an output device and internally in the driver, they talk to one another. So I can get the topology and then the TV device detects and playback device. It's all very nice, well emulated. So uh, there are actually two main ways of running the compliance test. The first is minus A, or full is, I think, uh, test adapter. So this will test. This is basically similar to what V4L2 compliance does. So it's testing all the IOCTOLs, testing what happens when you give it an invalid IOCTOL, and all the basics are tested here. I'm not continuing that, it takes too long. But this is the least interesting bit 
more interesting is what happens when you provide a remote device. So now the TV device is trying to test the remote device. And you see there are some failures here because there, I, it, I didn't start some, uh, some helper functionality. But it is going through all the various CEC features and testing whether the remote side supports a feature and how well it's done and if everything is correct or not. So this allows me to test whether a display, for example, implements this uh, correctly. A lot of the CEC compliance tests are very similar to v 4 l 2 compliance. It makes sense since it worked both. So I used the same template, it worked very well. And just to show, say, Test. Uh, oh. oh. So here you see again all the fail on tests. It just keeps keeps going, and that is basically you just send messages, check what whether what you get back is actually something that's that's. Uh, that makes sense, and if not, you fail on it. So exactly the same method is used here that I use in v 2 compliance. <laughs> and it keeps the code simple. Um, oh. Oh, and lots of tests here. It's hard writing tests, it's annoying writing tests, so you want to make it as easy as possible for yourself. It, I mean, I, I went into programming to let the computer do the work, ideally not me. Never works out, by the way, because you always have more to do. Um, some resources. So this is the main Linux media infrastructure API, the main kernel tree. Viferal utils repository, bunch of mailing lists. And that's it for me. Any questions? There is one that just showed up in the yeah. uh, Let me drink something first. <clears throat> um, is CAC implemented as FIFA 2 Well, HDMI is implemented as a DRM KMS driver. So first you need to talk about the direction. So HDMI, if you have HDMI outputs, it is typically a DRM KMS driver. It doesn't have to be. You can make video for Linux HDMI output drivers. We actually have one. Um, that is ideal if you're just sending video because then you just give it a frame and it's outputs over HDMI and you don't have to deal with tiering or any of those other complications that DRM KMS has. You don't have a GPU or anything. It's very simple. Here's the data, here's the frame, send it out. But it's very rare. Almost all devices, they just have DRM KMS with some sort of a GPU or a frame buffer. and that is what you use for, v for HDMI output. For capture, it's video for Linux. That's nothing else. If you want to capture HDMI, that's going through video for Linux. That's the API for that. CEC is something that is valid for HDMI outputs, uh, HDMI capture, and also uh, dongles. So there are, a, should have one here on my desk, actually, where I can find it in between all the cables. I don't have a clean desk. You can't see it here, but I can guarantee that it's not clean at all. Ah, here. Um, don't know if you can see it. 
This is a little little dongle. It has a USB mini, uh, no, yeah, mini USB connector and an HDMI input and output. And it's sitting in between. And it's basically allowing you access to the CEC pin over USB. So this is something you can use for devices that do not support uh, CEC. And you can add it using something like this. So CEC is, is shared among different subsystems, but the framework for CEC is part of driver's media. But as I said, DRM KMS will actually be using that framework as well. And the main reason is the driver media is because I'm media maintainer and I have access to that. So that's why it ended up there. Any other questions, perhaps? And if you want to talk to me, I will be at the Prague uh, EOSS, uh, what stood embedded, I forgot what it stood for, the next Linux Foundation in Prague for uh, embedded Linux conference. I'll be there. So if you're interested in talking, then and you're there, then we can do that. That's uh, end of June, June yes. 26th through 30th, I think. Looks like this is it. I hope it was useful for you. It is. Uh, it's really useful. Um, I have. Um, I am mentoring uh, twenty-five people this time for Linux bug fixing, and they are. Uh, some of them are really interested in knowing how di uh, different uh, drivers are tested in hardware and in compliance tests, and, and so this is very useful um, to a, to them for sure, because uh, they don't always know where to find the uh, hardware and so on and. And having uh, you do this presentation about the virtual drivers and how we can test some of the stuff uh, API from the application side as well as the driver side and is very, very helpful. Great. Awesome. Well, thank you, Hans and Shua, for your time today. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation YouTube page later today, and a copy of the presentation slides will be added to the Linux Foundation website. We hope you are able to join us for future mentorship sessions. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.